Welcome to this fascinating video on the rise and fall of Enron. Enron was once a shining star in the energy industry, with its meteoric rise to become one of the world's largest energy companies. But as we'll soon discover, the company's success was built on a foundation of lies and deceit, which ultimately led to its downfall. Enron's story is a cautionary tale of greed, corruption, and corporate malfeasance. It's a story that has claimed many victims, the most tragic of which is a former vice chairman of the company who committed suicide, ostensibly as a result of his involvement in the scandal. On the surface, the motivations and attitudes that led to Enron's ultimate collapse appear straightforward. Individual and collective greed, born in an atmosphere of market euphoria and corporate arrogance. Nobody wanted to believe the company was too good to be true, not the company, its employees, analysts, or individual investors. So, for a while, almost no one did. Many people continued to buy the stock, the corporate mantra, and the dream. Meanwhile, the company engaged in a number of high-risk transactions, some of which fell outside of the company's standard asset risk control process. Many things went wrong in the early months of 2001, when Enron's stock price and debt rating collapsed due to a loss of investor and creditor trust. Methods used by the company to disclose its complicated financial dealings were incorrect and, in the opinion of some, deceptive. The company's failure to report its financial affairs transparently, followed by financial restatements revealing billions of dollars in omitted liabilities and losses, all contributed to its demise. The whole thing took place under the watchful eye of Arthur Anderson LP, which had a full floor of auditors assigned to Enron all year. Unlike a lot of other companies, I mean, the, the employees here had a lot of faith in Enron. I mean, definitely, we are, uh, there was a constant drive to always make things better here, to, to, to be a front runner. This was supposed to be a very solid company. No worries about your future, right? If you come from a small dot-com startup, you go to Enron to have a safe uh, uh, future. Enron was formed in 1985 following federal deregulation of natural gas pipelines by the merger of Houston Natural Gas and Internorth, a Nebraska pipeline company. Enron incurred massive debt as a result of the merger and no longer had exclusive rights to its pipelines as a result of deregulation. To survive, the company needed to develop a new and innovative business strategy to generate profits and cash flow. Kenneth Lay, the CEO, hired McKinsey and Co to help develop Enron's business strategy. The engagement was assigned to a young consultant named Jeffrey Skilling. Skilling, who had a background in banking and asset and liability management, proposed a radical solution to Enron's credit, cash, and profit problems in the gas pipeline business. Establish a gas bank in which Enron would buy gas from a network of suppliers and sell it to a network of consumers, contractually guaranteeing both supply and price charging fees for the transactions, and assuming the associated risks. The company created a new product, as well as a new paradigm for the industry thanks to the young consultant, the energy derivative. Kenneth Lay was so impressed with Skilling's brilliance that he established a new division called Enron Finance Corp. in 1990 and hired Skilling to run it. Enron Finance Corp. quickly dominated the market for natural gas contracts under Skilling's leadership with more contacts, access to supplies, and customers than any of its competitors. Enron's market power allowed it to accurately predict future prices, ensuring superior profits. I had worked at Enron um, for eight years by the time you know the summer of 2001 rolled around, and I stumbled across very large accounting fraud at Enron in, in a very typical fashion. Skilling began to change Enron's corporate culture to reflect the company's new image as a trading firm. He set out on a quest to hire the best and brightest traders, recruiting associates from the country's top MBA programs, and competing for talent with the largest and most prestigious investment banks. Enron pampered its associates with a long list of corporate perks in exchange for grueling schedules, including concierge services and a company gym. Skilling rewarded production with uncapped merit-based bonuses, allowing traders to eat what they killed. Andrew Fasto, a 29-year-old Kellogg MBA 
who had worked on leveraged buyouts and other complex deals at Continental Illinois Bank in Chicago, was one of Skilling's first hires in 1990. Fasto became Skilling's prodigy in the same way that Skilling had become Blaze. Fasto rose quickly through the ranks and was named Chief Financial Officer in 1998. Fasto oversaw the company's financing as Skilling oversaw its vast trading operation. As Enron's reputation in the outside world grew, the internal culture appears to have darkened. Skilling established the Performance Review Committee, which became known as the country's harshest employee ranking system. The 360-degree review was based on Enron's values of respect, integrity, communication, and excellence. However, associates came to believe that the only true measure of performance was the amount of profit they could generate. Everyone in the organization became instantly motivated to do deals and post earnings in order to achieve top ratings. Employees were rated on a scale of one to five, with fives typically being fired within six months. The lower an employee's PRC score, the closer he or she came to skilling, the higher the score, the closer he or she came to being fired. Every year, Skilling's division was known for replacing up to 15% of its workforce. Internal competition was fierce, and immediate gratification was valued more than long-term potential. As paranoia grew, trading contracts began to include highly restrictive confidentiality clauses. Many of the company's trading contracts, as well as its disclosures, became shrouded in secrecy. There were very sophisticated people taking advantage of employees' money in their savings plan. Coincidentally, but not inadvertently, the United States economy was experiencing its longest bull market in history during the 1990s. Enron's corporate leadership, with the exception of Lay, was mostly made up of young people who had never experienced a prolonged bear market. New investment opportunities were emerging everywhere, including in energy futures markets. Wall Street expected double-digit growth from almost every business, and Enron was determined to deliver. Skilling was named Enron's chief operating officer in 1996. He persuaded Lay that the gas bank model could also be applied to the electric energy market. Skilling and Lay traveled across the country, pitching the idea to power company executives and energy regulators. The company became a major political player in the United States, lobbying for electric utility deregulation. Enron purchased Portland General Electric Corp for approximately $2 billion in 1997. By the end of that year, Skilling had transformed Enron Capital and Trade Resources into the country's largest wholesale buyer and seller of natural gas and electricity. Revenue increased from $2 billion to $7 billion, and the division's workforce increased from 200 to over 2,000. They were ready to create a market for anything that anyone was willing to trade, using the same concept that had proven so successful with the gas bank. Futures contracts in coal, paper, steel, water, and even weather. In the eyes of the financial world, Enron's most exciting development was the establishment of Enron Online in October 1999. Enron Online, a website for trading electronic commodities, was significant for at least two reasons. For starters, Enron was a party to every transaction on the platform. Traders received extremely valuable information in real time about the long and short parties to each trade, as well as the prices of the products. Second, because Enron was either a buyer or a seller in every transaction, credit risk management was critical, and Enron's credit was the foundation that gave the energy community confidence that Enron Online provided a secure transaction environment. In 2000, Enron Online was an overnight success, handling $335 billion in online commodity trades. The internet was launched by the technological world, and the IPO market for technology and broadband communications companies began to take off. Enron announced an ambitious plan in January 2000 to build a high-speed broadband telecommunications network and to trade network capacity, or bandwidth, similarly to how it traded electricity or natural gas. Enron and Blockbuster announced a deal in July of that year to provide video on demand to customers all over the world via high-speed internet lines. While Enron poured hundreds of millions of dollars into broadband with little return, Wall Street rewarded the strategy with a stock price increase of up to $40, 
a factor it would have to be discounted later when the broadband bubble burst. Enron stock reached an all-time high of $90.56 in August 2000, and the company was lauded by Fortune and other business publications as one of the most admired and innovative in the world. Enron getting approval from the SEC uh, for so-called mark-to-market, which is actually much more appropriately called mark-to-model accounting for their energy derivative business. In the mid-1990s, Enron implemented mark-to-market accounting for the energy trading business and used it on an unprecedented scale for its trading transactions. When companies have outstanding energy-related or other derivative contracts, either assets or liabilities, on their balance sheets at the end of a quarter, they must adjust them to fair market value, booking unrealized gains or losses to the period's income statement. The application of these rules to long-term futures contracts in commodities such as gas is complicated by the lack of quoted prices on which to base valuations. Companies that own these types of derivative instruments are free to create and employ discretionary valuation models based on their own assumptions and methods. For several years, the Financial Accounting Standards Board's Emerging Issues Task Force has debated how to value and disclose energy-related contracts. It has only been able to conclude that a one-size-fits-all approach will not work and that requiring companies to disclose all of the assumptions and estimates underlying earnings would result in disclosures that were so voluminous that they would be useless. For a company like Enron, which is constantly under pressure to beat earnings estimates, valuation estimates may have significantly overstated earnings. Furthermore, Unrealized trading gains accounted for slightly more than half of the company's $1.41 billion reported pre-tax profit in 2000 and roughly one-third of the company's reported pre-tax profit in 1999. Well, that's a, you know, I've always been theological on mark-to-market accounting because I've seen so much of what people do when they're allowed to use their imagination on balance sheets or income statements. And, and frankly, um, American business misbehaved in a big way, particularly in the 90s, but, but uh, people did play games with numbers, and, and they probably still do, but, but, it, was, but there was, it was almost accepted as a way of, of, of doing business. So I've always been suspicious when you give a CEO a pen and tell him it's the honor system. And anything other than mark-to-market works in that direction. Now, it's true, I think, that mark-to-market uh, has had a... It's been some gasoline on the fire and... Companies like Denergy, Duke Energy, El Paso, and Williams began to follow Enron's lead in the late 1990s. By the end of 2000, Enron's competitive advantage, as well as its massive profit margins, had begun to erode. The success of each new market entrant reduced Enron's profit margins even further. It operated with increasing leverage, becoming more akin to a hedge fund than a trading firm. Meanwhile, energy prices began to fall in the first quarter of 2001, and the global economy entered a slump, dampening energy market volatility and reducing the opportunity for large, rapid trading gains that had previously made Enron so profitable. Deals were completed at a rapid pace, particularly in the finance division, with little regard for whether they aligned with the company's strategic goals or complied with the company's risk management policies. Good deal versus bad deal, said one knowledgeable Enron employee. It didn't make a difference. It could be done if it had a positive net present value. Positive NPV was sometimes irrelevant in the name of strategic significance. Enron's foundations were cracking and Skilling's paper house built on trust's stilts was crumbling. Enron filed for bankruptcy December 2, 2001. At the peak of its success, the company's shares were worth more than $90 each. But just before Enron filed for Chapter 11, they traded at 26 cents. Lay announced his retirement in February 2001 and named Skilling president and CEO of Enron. Skilling held the company's annual analyst conference in February, boasting that the stock which was valued at around $80, should be trading at around $126 per share. Enron and Blockbuster announced the cancellation of their video-on-demand agreement in March. By then, the stock had dropped to the mid-$60. Throughout the spring and summer, Enron's risky deals and underperforming investments of various kinds began to unravel, resulting in a massive cash shortfall. Senior management, 
which had been voting with their feet since August 2000. Selling Enron stock during a bull market continued to exit, taking hundreds of millions of dollars with them. Skilling resigned on August 14, just six months after being named CEO, citing personal reasons. The stock price fell below $40 that week, and with the exception of a brief recovery in early October following the sale of Portland General, continued to fall to below $30 per share. In an internal memo to Lay in August, Sharon Watkins, a company vice president, expressed concerns about the lack of disclosure of the substance of FASTO's related party transactions. She ended the memo by expressing concern that the company would implode under a series of accounting scandals. Lay notified the company's lawyers, Vinson and Elkins, as well as the audit partner at Enron's auditing firm, Arthur Anderson LLP, so that the matter could be thoroughly investigated. Enron's proverbial ship had hit the iceberg that would eventually sink it. Enron announced its first quarterly loss in more than four years on October 16, after taking $1 billion in charges on underperforming businesses. The company terminated the Raptor hedging arrangements, which would have resulted in the company issuing 58 million Enron shares to offset the company's private equity losses, significantly diluting earnings. It also disclosed the reversal of a $1.2 billion asset and equity entry made as a result of dealings with these arrangements. This disclosure drew the attention of the SEC. On October 17, the company announced that it had changed the plan administrators for its employees' 401 pension plan effectively locking their investments for 30 days and preventing employees from selling Enron stock. According to the company, this decision was made months ago. Whatever that is, the timing of the decision has certainly raised questions. Enron announced on October 22 that the SEC was investigating related party transactions between Enron and the partnerships owned by Fasto, who was fired two days later. Enron announced on November 8 that it would restate its financial statements back to 1997 to reflect the consolidation of the SPEs it had omitted, as well as to book Anderson's recommended adjustments from those years, which the company had previously deemed immaterial. This restatement resulted in an additional $591 million in losses over the next four years, as well as a $628 million increase in liabilities as of the end of 2000. The equity markets reacted immediately to the restatement, driving the stock price down to less than $10 per share. According to one analyst, the company spent $5 billion in cash in 50 days. A merger agreement with smaller crosstown competitor Dinigy was announced on November 9, but was rescinded by Dinigy on November 28 due to Enron's failure to fully disclose its off-balance sheet debt, which resulted in Enron's rating being downgraded to junk status. On November 30, the stock closed at an incredible 26 cents per share. On December 2, the company filed for bankruptcy. December 2, 2001, the day of the bankruptcy was a Sunday. The very next day, Monday, 4,000 Enron employees were thrown out of work, many of them onto the street behind me. Ultimately, more than 20,000 had their careers uprooted. Many lost all their retirement savings. The people at the top lost their dignity. They became national villains. Some went to prison. For the man at the very top, it was a sudden and total fall from grace. Many Enron executives were charged with various crimes and sentenced to prison. Notably, both Skilling and Lay were convicted in 2006 on various conspiracy and fraud charges. Skilling was sentenced to more than 24 years in prison, but served only 12. Lay, who faced more than 45 years in prison, died before his sentence was handed down. Fasto also pleaded guilty in 2006 and was sentenced to six years in prison before being released in 2011. Arthur Anderson was also under intense scrutiny, and the U.S. Department of Justice indicted the firm for obstruction of justice in March 2002. Clients who wanted to reassure investors that their financial statements met the highest accounting standards left Anderson in favor of competitors. They were quickly followed by Anderson employees and entire office buildings. Thousands of employees were also laid off. On June 15, 2002, Arthur Anderson was found guilty of evidence shredding and lost its license to practice public accounting. Three years later, 
Anderson lawyers were successful in convincing the United States Supreme Court to unanimously overturn the obstruction of justice verdict due to faulty jury instructions. But by then, the firm had been reduced to 200 employees managing its lawsuits. Hundreds of civil suits were also filed by shareholders against Enron and Anderson. While a number of lawsuits were successful, most investors lost money and employees received only a portion of their pension fund contributions. Following the scandal, a slew of new regulations and legislation were enacted to improve the accuracy of financial reporting for publicly traded companies. The Sarbanes-Oxley Act, 2002, the most important of these measures, imposed harsh penalties for destroying, altering, or fabricating financial records. The act also forbade auditing firms from conducting concurrent consulting work for the same clients. And that, my friends, is the story of the rise and fall of Enron. From a small gas pipeline company to one of the most powerful corporations in the world, Enron's ascent was meteoric, but its downfall was even more spectacular. As we look back on this cautionary tale, we can see the many warning signs that were ignored and the ethical lapses that were allowed to flourish. But perhaps the most important lesson to take away from the Enron scandal is the importance of transparency and accountability in corporate governance. So let us learn from the mistakes of the past and strive to build a better future. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more thought-provoking content.